What's up my beautiful people? Welcome to the Jonathan Benaya podcast. And I must throw this out there. This is not really an episode, but it's more of an update. <laughs> it's uh, been really a busy week on my end and my time has not been my own. Uh, but with how quickly this show has been growing and how you guys are supporting it, I thought I'd jump on here today just to say hi and also just let you know that um, I've been recording quite an interesting episode for the next week. Uh, fingers crossed. <laughs> I really hope it gets finalized before uh, publishing that uh, next week, next Sunday. Uh, this particular one is a discussion on the sticky subject of trophy hunting around the African continent and I'm fortunate to have some really notable, or call them big names, in global conservation on the podcast. So yes, wish me luck on that. Uh, that episode should drop on the 5th of Feb and that might just be the first episode in the new month. But since you're here, how about I share a short story that seemed to catch some heat in the second half of the week. Uh, if you haven't already seen it, um, then you probably aren't following me on Twitter, which you should be doing already. <laughs> there will be a link in uh, the podcast, not a podcast description, with a link tree where you can see, where you can find my Twitter bio, Twitter profile, sorry. So this story is one of many fascinating tales from Ugandan history. But quite surprisingly, it's one of those stories that is not often told enough. <laughs> Anyways, um, the story involved a double plane crash involving a famous American journalist and novelist, Ernest Hemingway, whose name you might have heard about. Um, at the time of the crash, he was exploring Maction Falls National Park together with his wife, Mary Walsh Hemingway. Uh, but, but just before I share a bit of that, um, I know some of you might be new here, so let's run the intro as we always do, and then um, I'll talk more about the Twitter thread after the short break. What's up, guys? Welcome to the Jonathan Benaya podcast, a show that is wild, very wild. We try to put out a new episode every Sunday with discussions ranging around how to make the natural world a better place, creating awesome images, telling stories with words, wildlife films and photography, with occasional musings on sound and tech. I do share a lot of my own personal experiences and from time to time, I'll have one or two guests on the podcast to share some insightful discussions. If you are fascinated about the natural world, especially natural history films and photography, environmental conservation, and African travel at large, this podcast will have you in a spin. So thank you so much for tuning in and enjoy your time here. Alrighty, welcome back to the Jonathan Benaya podcast where we talk about the earth, images, words, wildlife films and photography, tourism and travel, and occasionally music. So as I mentioned before the break, I put up a Twitter thread on Wednesday, I believe, and it's since fascinated quite a number of folks, and here's why. Once upon a time. Go ahead. This is where you say time, time, time. <laughs> uh, okay, in January 1954, um, which this week is 69 years ago, Ernest and Mary Hemingway were involved in two plane crashes in two days <laughs> while on their Ugandan leg uh, of an African safari. Uh, but let's just rewind a bit, a little bit, to where this story could have begun. And also, let's rewind just back so that we can get quite a, a bit of context of why it is and should be such big news. Ernest Hemingway, whose full name is Ernest Miller Hemingway, was born on July 21st. 1899. He was born in the suburb of Cicero. I don't know if I pronounced that well, <laughs> which uh, in present day would be around the Chicago, Illinois area. That's in the United States of America. Uh, Ernest was the first son of a gentleman called Clarence Edmonds Hemingway. Uh, Clarence was a physician and a medical doctor. His mother, Grace Hall Hemingway, was an American opera singer. Uh, but she was also a music teacher 
and a painter. Talk of a love story involving the sciences and the highlights of the arts world coming together to bond and give birth to one of the biggest names in global history. Now, while growing up, Ernest Hemingway was educated in public schools and he took on the art to write while in high school. It was with a pen and paper that the youthful Ernest Hemingway caught the attention of both his peers and tutors. And I'm quite certain <laughs> he did catch the attention of some of the finest looking, I'll call them the cute girls at school. He was active, he was outstanding. But the parts of his boyhood that mattered most were those warm summers spent with his family on Walloon Lake in Upper Michigan. In 1917, Ernest graduated from high school and impatient for a less sheltered environment. He refused to do college, uh, but he went to Kansas City where he was employed as an apprentice reporter for the Kansas Star newspaper for a period of eight months between 1917 and 1918. It was during that internship at the Kansas Star that he had his first encounter with the principles of newspaper-style publications, which we all know <laughs> uh, advise reporters to write short sentences in vigorous English uh, but avoid the common evil of extravagant adjectives. Now, if you know your history quite well, uh, one of the deadliest global conflicts in history was taking place around this time, and the talk of the town among youthful lads like Ernest Hemingway was a lot less about how um, good or proficient you are with a pen and paper or how good a writer you are, but it was more about how brave you are. And there was no bigger stage to prove your bravado than at the global stage, the First World War. Now, in the past, Ernest Hemingway had tried to get into the military, but he was repeatedly rejected because of an eye problem. He however managed to enter the First World War as an ambulance driver for the American Red Cross, where he got injured and hospitalized in Milan. It was in Milan at the age of 19 that Hemingway fell in love with an American Red Cross nurse who, as we read, refused to marry him. Her name was Agnes von Kurowski. Now remember that name. Ernest Hemingway would in his later years write a novel describing a departure from military service. This 1929 novel was titled A Farewell to Arms. In this book, he featured a character, Catherine Buckley, who, as we now know, was inspired by his encounter in Italy with that uh, Red Cross nurse, Agnes von Kurowski. In the book, uh, Catherine Buckley falls in love with Henry, an American ambulance driver, uh, who, as we now know, <laughs> was Ernest Hemingway writing about his encounter with Agnes. This grim and lyrical novel was a fusion of a love story with a, with a, with a war story and to this day it is still one of um, Hemingway's most treasured pieces. Now upon returning home to America in order to nurse his wounds from the First World War, Hemingway renewed his efforts at writing and while he did this he worked some odd jobs as well in Chicago. Um, and later on it said that he sailed for France as a foreign correspondent for the Toronto Star. Now, if you don't already know, the Toronto Star, or call it the Daily Star, was a newspaper and still is a daily publication out of Toronto, Canada. And it might still be the biggest newspaper in the North American country. Hemingway's time at the Toronto Star involved writing as a stringer, or call it a freelance journalist. Uh, he later on became part of staff, and before leaving the paper, he served as a foreign correspondent writing mostly for their Saturday feature. Between 1920 and 1923, his pieces for the Toronto Star were quite remarkably personal, which is not what is expected of, um, if I could call it, a mainstream journalist. Oftentimes, reporting points more towards being objective, and it points less <laughs> towards running loose with emotions or um, writing with, if you could call it, personal feelings, uh, like a person of my nature <laughs> would write. But in writing about what he saw and heard and also what he learned, Hemingway continued to put his personality, his tests, and even his prejudices into the articles he wrote. And to his benefit, his employers at the Toronto Star were fine with bending the rules, uh, the journalism rules a bit for him. They allowed him to live 
free with a pen and let his imagination run loose. And in return, all they were asking for or all they were demanding was color from the pieces that he wrote. And it was definitely color in its richest sense that Ernest Hemingway continued to supply uh, with such great precision in each and every story that he wrote and filed for the newspaper. It was on his foreign corresponding trips in France um, for the Toronto Star that he was inspired by some of the then big names in journalism to begin publishing novels. And I believe it's the novels that really introduced him to the limelight. And as we like to often say today, the rest became history for him. The writing of books occupied Hemingway for most of the years following the First World War. He remained in Paris uh, but traveled quite a bit around the world to um, participate in activities like skiing, uh, bullfighting. He also enjoyed fishing quite a bit. So you might just call him um, an older, or an, uh, I don't want to say ancient, <laughs> uh, let's just say an older version of uh, people like CNN's Richard Quest, who you might know from Quest Means Business. Or who is that guy? Peter, is he Peter Greenberg from CNBC? Um, you could also talk about people like uh, British adventurer Edward Michael Bear Grylls, who I'm so certain you know from, or you probably have seen from that television series, Man vs. Wild, or I think it's also called Bone Survivor. And I think Ernest Hemingway could also be considered uh, one of the greatest travel writers, although that's not a title that was or um, has been used enough <laughs> to refer to him. Hemingway also traveled a lot for hunting, which by then had become part of his life and uh, pretty much formed the background for much of his writing. It was his love for hunting and the outdoors that led him to Africa. He traveled for the contemporary safari in destinations like Tanganyika, which is present-day Tanzania, and while there, he would also hunt some of the continent's big game. Ernest Hemingway would go on to write some of his finest stories, including a novel titled The Snows of Kilimanjaro in the 1920s, and uh, there was another one titled uh, Green Hills of Africa, that was around the 1933-1934 period. Both novels were inspired by his Tanganyika escapades. Around this time, uh, that's in the 1930s, Spain was in uh, the midst of a civil war and since he was uh, deeply attached to that country, Hemingway made four trips to Madrid once more as a correspondent and he covered the Spanish civil war quite extensively. Now let's just fast forward to the 1940s um, as the second world war was progressing. Ernest Hemingway made his way to London as a journalist where he would keep a close tie with the military and this allowed him to experience a good deal of the action <laughs> from where it was taking place, uh, from, from the core of the action. He flew several missions with the Royal Air Force and, and quite notably was part of the team that crossed the English Channel with the American troops on that fateful day of Tuesday 6th, June 1944, uh, which as scholars of history we all know was the popular D-Day or as it's also called uh, the Normandy Landings. And although he was known more as a journalist, Ernest Hemingway impressed professional soldiers, <laughs> not only as a man of uh, courage in battle, uh, but also as a real expert in military matters like guerrilla activities and um, intelligence collection. At this time, he had also bought a home in Cuba, and after uh, that ugly war in Europe, the Second World War, Hemingway returned to Cuba where he began to work seriously on his writing again. As you can already tell, his name had by now become synonymous with the big names in journalism. And if they had Google search back then, Ernest Hemingway would be way up there in the search engine uh, for the planet's top scribes, or call them journalists. He continued to travel out of Cuba quite extensively uh, and on a trip to Africa with who is said to be his fourth wife, <laughs> as reported by the New York Times in 1944, Mary Welsh Hemingway, Ernest made his way to Entebbe in Uganda via Nairobi, Kenya. And it's said that this was a week after their safari in Amboseli National Park. Now, for some reason, the New York Times article reports that Amboseli National Park is located in Tanganyika, which by now we all know is present-day Tanzania. But we know that Amboseli National Park is currently located in Kenya, <laughs> if I'm not wrong. Uh, but it might also be because Amboseli, because this, this is a couple of years back, it might be that Amboseli is, uh, uh, it might be because Amboseli is not too far from Namanga border, which is the border between Kenya and Tanzania. 
Anyways, as we will see, his time in Uganda resulted in one of the most trending stories at the time. And it might still be an award winner in the present days, especially at a time when the hotel he stayed in, that's Masindi Hotel, uh, which is also Uganda's oldest hotel, is I believe set to celebrate 100 years this year. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> But also the story of his double plane crash just made 69 years this week. And it will celebrate uh, its 70th anniversary around this same time next year. That right there is my coded message for tourism players to wake up and think about how to use stories like this uh, in building a narrative around destination promotion and marketing. But what exactly happened in that fateful month of Jan 1954 while the Hemingways were on safari in Uganda? What is that that happened that Kanye West and uh, Kim Kardashian survived when they were in the same park uh, just a few years ago? I have told this story countless times and each time I do, I'm impressed at the faces of people <laughs> watching or listening. It, it, it's many a time a story of amazement. You can see a, a sense of amazement on most people's faces as they listen. And it seems to be the same reaction that I'm getting on Twitter quite similar to uh, a reaction that I got from the tourism students of Makere University Business School, that's MOOBS, a few years ago when I was uh, invited to do a guest lecture. And I narrated this same story as part of my lecture <laughs> in its shorter version. But this time around, let me attempt to tell the story through the eyes of a witness. And let me flip through the pages of a very old journal that I stumbled upon online several years ago. And I quite fortunately made a copy of my own, which I've printed, um, as they say, for future purposes. <laughs> it's part of many journals published by the British Overseas Service Pensioners Association, which, if you don't know, comprises of uh, members of the former colonial service. And in this journal, they narrate some of their stories from serving in British colonies and protectorates. This particular journal is journal number 92, if I'm not wrong. This first-hand account was written by J.R.F. Mills, who is also the man credited with opening the Maxim Falls National Park in 1952, when the British administration first established the National Parks Act of Uganda. So here is the Hemingway story as reported by Mr. Mills, and I will paraphrase from both his journal and another New York Times article that was published or written around the same time. All right, let's get right into it. Shortly after I had started to develop the Maxion Falls National Park, one Saturday afternoon in Jan 1954, I happened to be in Masindi. About 5 p.m., I met the assistant district commissioner who told me that Mr. Hemingway and his wife, who were flying around Uganda, had lost contact. I told him jokingly <laughs> that they may have landed at one of the various airstrips in the country and not reported back. Around this time, it was near dusk and it was too late to do anything. We would have to wait till the following day to ask a few questions. Now, the next morning about 9 a.m., I went to see the assistant district commissioner again on the same matter. And this time he said that he had not heard anything about the couple, but he would telephone Entebbe where the main airport was situated and where their flight would have been expected to come from. Now upon phoning Entebbe, the assistant district commissioner said that he was told the Hemingways were still missing and a search was on to find him. My task as the head of the Maxion Falls National Park was to search the park while other officials searched elsewhere. The park spanned an area of 1,500 square miles of raw wilderness with no known human settlement. It was bisected by the River Nile with the Maxion Waterfalls forming its centerpiece. Now let me just pause right here for a fact check. Mr. Mill's measurement of uh, Maxion Falls National Park is quite equal or the same size that we know the park to be today. Current literature says Maxion Falls National Park spans an area of uh, 3,893 square kilometers and that's quite I guess that's the equivalent of what Mr. Mills says is 1,500 square miles. Let's get back to Mr. Mills journal as the search for Hemingway begins. <laughs> Apart from myself and a few park rangers, I had a very small labor force who were working on a track or call it a path from Masindi to the Nile area. But the progress on this road had not really gone far. And being a Sunday, most of the staff had gone off for the weekend. However, I sent for those that were in camp to come and join me in the search 
let's just have another fact check. Um, although the crash uh, is reported to have taken place on Jan 25th, 1954, which is the day that we see most newspaper articles uh, seem to have published this story. When you listen to Mr. Mills' story of the crash, uh, the, the, the plane crash that took place over a weekend, it kind of shows that uh, the Hemingways could have crashed on either the 23rd or the 24th of Jan. <laughs> um, and uh, I get the feeling, uh, knowing that back then the internet didn't exist, uh, the telegram to the Western world could have taken quite a bit to reach the news outlets. And therefore, the story could only have made it onto uh, f the front pages of the leading newspapers around the world on Jan 25th. And that's the date that we usually have reported. Jan 25th, 1954. Which, according to my calendar, was a Monday. It wasn't a weekend, as Mills reports. So there's a bit of context. But let's just go back to Mr. Mills' journal. I set off in my Land Rover with two rangers to commence the search. The vegetation in the national park was thick and almost impenetrable, and its plains had so many elephants and buffalo. We drove and drove and drove across the countryside for some very good hours when the thought came to me that I was probably achieving very little. <laughs> so I made the decision to climb to a small hill to get a better view. After a while, I saw a Lancaster bomber flying through the sky. Now, Lancasters were part of the British Second World War heavy duty fleet. Um, I tried to wave to them, but they didn't seem to see me. I would learn later on that the Lancaster could have been flying from Nairobi, where I think it had been involved with the Mau Mau rebellion. Moments later, I spotted another plane, and this time it was a de Havilland Rapid, which was also flying through the sky and it seemed to be quartering around the park or uh, making circles around the park. This particular 6 to 8 passenger plane was part of the East African Airways fleet, and in it that day was Captain Reg Cartwright, a very good friend to wildlife. Moments later, both planes converged above my hill and proceeded to give me a flying display, <laughs> diving down, going off, and returning to do the same. I very much enjoyed the display as I stood there and waved my arms. Eventually, the Lancaster dropped a message tied to a handkerchief and the message read in quotes, Have located plane close to the falls. Please go there and if all is well, stand on the wing and wave your arms. Let's first have a first check. For context and just so you have a decent picture of what Marshall Falls National Park is, uh, the park is located in the northwestern part of Uganda and it is Uganda's largest national park and uh, Uganda's oldest conservation area. Marshall Falls National Park is dissected by the River Nile into a northern section and a southern section. The southern section is served by the Kampala Masindi route, while the northern section is accessed through another route through uh, the, the Kampala Pakwach Highway. You can also reach the park directly from Gulu for those coming from the northern part of the country. Now, the park's infrastructure has since improved with, with a fully tarmac road, including the Para Bridge, which now connects the southern bank to the northern bank and replaces that old and problematic ferry service that some of you I'm quite sure experienced. And if you are listening to this and probably reading about articles recently, uh, this is very different from what the situation was a few years ago. And suddenly it's nowhere close to the times where Mr. Mills is writing, uh, uh, where his team was searching for the Hemingways. And the fact that he's coming from Masindi, we can already kind of tell that they should or rather could have been searching on the southern bank of the Nile. That's around uh, the top of the falls area, that side of that side of the park, if you've been to Marchion Falls. All right, let's get back to Mr. Mills' journal. I set off in my Land Rover in the rough direction of the falls, and as I did, the Lancaster quite remarkably formed a compass that led the way. When I seemed to go off track, it flew down to correct my direction. After a while of long driving, as I got closer to the Nile River, the bush wilderness became very thick and I could go no further with the Land Rover. Together with the two park rangers that I had with me, we set off on foot and we continued to be closely watched by the Lancaster in the sky, which 
when we seemed to divert off the path, <laughs> the plane flew down in a manner to correct our line. And eventually, we arrived at the top of the falls. And around there was the aircraft that we had been searching for. The aircraft had crash landed into a small clearing close to the falls. Quite surprisingly, there were no bodies, there were no debris, and the plane doors were shut. I did realize that one of the wheels of the undercarriage had been broken, but otherwise, the plane appeared little damaged. It looked like the chap who was flying it did a neat job of landing the aircraft so professionally. I could see very visibly the identification letters VPKLII which very clearly showed that this was the exact plane that we were looking for. But the question in my mind was where could the occupants have gone? There was no sign of blood anywhere. Did the Hemingways and their pilot try to swim across the Nile? Where obviously <laughs> they would never have survived the croc infested waters or its fierce hippos. Or were they mauled, call it eaten, by one of the park's predators, the lions and leopards? Or did they walk into the angry path of a buffalo herd? I stood on the aircraft's wing and waved my arms as my friends in the sky had instructed me to do. And once they heard my signal, the Lancaster waggled his wings in acknowledgement and flew off. Perhaps wherever they went, they would catch a cold beer. Well, back in the Maction Falls National Park where we were and my team, it was the middle of the day. It was very hot. It was very humid. And I very much would have used a cold beer that day. We had to walk back to the Land Rover and my team would return to their camp while I began to drive back to Masindi where I then got the news that the couple and their captain had been found alive. At the time, an old abandoned telephone line from Masindi to Arua in West Nile ran across the park and the waterfall. The cause of the plane crash could have been that there had been low flying over the falls when the plane's tail wheel got caught in the line. I did also hear from some people that the Hemingways could also have missed their routine fueling stop in Masindi and therefore ran out of fuel while in the park. Now, at the time, the East African Railways and Harbors ran a large launch or call it a boat cruise from the Butiaba area on the shores of Lake Albert up the Nile to view wildlife and this cruise would climax at the bottom of the falls. Arriving this Sunday morning at the bottom of the falls, the launch trip had been met by the Hemingways and their pilot, chilling on the banks of the Nile and waiting for any hopes of help. They had quite miraculously spent a hot and uncomfortable night in a national park in a hot aircraft. And while narrating his ordeal, the pilot said that at times the plane was visited by elephants in the night and I can't help but imagine how the mosquitoes could have tortured them all night long. Now the pilot and the Hemingways were invited aboard onto the launch cruise and they would be taken back to Butiaba where they would get a connecting flight back to Entebbe. In the meantime, Captain Cartwright, who as I did mention earlier, was flying the Rapid, had flown to Butiaba where there was a small little used airstrip. Our plan was for Captain Cartwright to arrive there in time and then wait to take the Hemingways back to Entebbe. So let's just call this the evacuation flight. Now just when you thought the couple was already having a bad day, <laughs> as this second plane took off, the wheels hit an anthill and then a thorn bush at the end of the runway which caused the plane to nose dive. Luckily, it did not catch fire immediately and it's reported that Ernest Hemingway was the first to get out of the plane quite remarkably quick. <laughs> the others also got out of the aircraft before it did catch fire. They all sustained injuries with Hemingway suffering yet another traumatic brain injury with a fractured skull and an injury to the spine. The party then traveled to Masindi by car and it's said that on that evening, <laughs> the stock of gin and whiskey at the Masindi hotel was seriously depleted. The following day, it's no surprise that they would not be flying again. It's reported that they chose to head back to Entebbe by road. Following the first accident, word had spread around the world that the writer had died in a plane crash. Many publications had gone on to prematurely publish his obituary before the couple finally arrived at their destination in Entebbe 
where they would obviously get on another plane that would fortunately this time <laughs> successfully deliver them to their destination. The Hemingways, as they say, would live to tell their story another day. But despite surviving several wars, including both um, the biggest wars in human history, as well as his double plane crash in Uganda's Maction Falls National Park, Ernest Hemingway wasn't immortal after all. In 1961, a few weeks before what would have been his 62nd birthday, and seven years after that crazy double crash in Uganda, the news of Hemingway's death shocked the world. It was a 12-gauge shotgun that had ended the turbulent life of this famous author while in his Idaho Canyon home near the Sun Valley in the United States of America. It was one shot that was fired in his head to what his wife believed was an accident as he was cleaning the gun, although some other reports claim that it could have been suicidal. What a life. Now, if you are quite inquisitive and curious like myself, uh, you might know that there are several stories around the River Nile in Uganda, and several of these link back to Maction Falls National Park. And I feel like if we did a bit more of digging up and uh, if we built a narrative around them, we might just interest one other person or even many more people to visit some of these destinations, especially with a growing trend of set jetters who are basically people who travel to destinations inspired by films and stories and documentaries they've read or seen. One of such big similar stories is uh, The Making of the African Queen, which was a movie that was partly filmed in the Maction Falls National Park on the River Nile. The African Queen, also known as S.L. Livingstone, was the name of two boats used in the 1951 movie starring Humphrey Bogart and Catherine Hepburn. Now, for those that don't know, Humphrey Bogart had acted in several movies uh, in classical Hollywood cinema, and it was his career that had made him an American cultural icon, which is quite the case with many actors that we have today. But it was his role in The African Queen that won him his very first and only American Academy Award, or call it his Oscar. And this award was for the best actor in 1951. Now, Humphrey Bogart, till his death, considered The African Queen the best film of his career. Now, if you are someone like me, you would be interested in knowing where the boat that they used in Maction Falls is. <laughs> now, the main boat used in the movie, because most of the scenes were shot in the US, is available on public display in Florida, and it is preserved as part of uh, the United States natural history. The second boat, on the other hand, which is said to be the actual boat used for the scenes shot on the Nile, those scenes as the boat makes its way through hippos and other wildlife. Well, that boat can now be found in Uganda's eastern town of Jinja, and it's now owned by a gentleman called Cam Mark Lee, who is from New Zealand, and he runs one of the lodge properties on the shores of the Nile in Jinja. So how did I get to know about this? Um, a friend of mine sent me some old pics. Uh, he actually shared them on his status. Uh, the photos of his dad standing in front of a boat that had the African Queen on it. So I, I was quite inquisitive. I asked him, um, I'd like to know a bit more about this boat. And then he goes on to tell me that it's, it's the very same boat that I was looking for uh, the, 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 that uh, was used in the film. Uh, so, so this friend of mine reveals that his dad, um, who I believe is uh, Yank Evans, that's his name, discovered the boat abandoned in Maction Falls National Park several years ago. And this was after it had been used in the film. So his dad sold the boat to the current owner, who is uh, Mr. Cam McLee of Ginger. <laughs> and it's in Ginger that you can find the boat. And I just recently learned that the boat is now sailing again on the Nile River. I don't know if it uh, takes tourists. It might need a bit more digging up. Uh, but the boat is operational on the Nile, from what I hear. And perhaps I'll follow up that story and bring the detail of the story to you. But I think this episode has to end at some point. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that is a short version of the long story of Ernest Hemingway's short-lived stay in what we now call the Pearl of Africa. <laughs> So yes guys, that's gonna be it for today. I hope you enjoyed this impromptu episode as much as I did. If you did, go ahead and hit that like button, share the link in your circles, and let's get this conversation beyond this platform. Hey.
And for you folks that just can't get enough and would like to have more of such uh, discoveries, more of these conversations, be sure to subscribe to the podcast. For those listening on Apple Podcasts, you are able to also leave a star rating on the podcast, but you might also be able to drop a comment as well. The podcast is now available on all major streaming platforms including Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Pandora, CastBox, Deezer, and several other platforms. And the podcast for the last four months has been ranked number one in the leading travel and conservation-inspired podcasts in Uganda. That's well ahead podcast shows like the BBC Earth Show. And that's really due to you guys tuning in, but also rating the show and sharing it with your friends. As always, if you would like to make a contribution to the conversation or send in a question, you can always email me directly at contact at jonathanbenaya.com or ahabenathan at pm.me. Both emails will be linked in the podcast notes below. And maybe just finally, I'd like to say a very big thanks to our Patreons, as always. Through your pledges, we are able to keep this show alive and running. If you'd like to subscribe to our Patreon account, that link too will be in the podcast description. Alright, until next time, happy travels, happy discoveries, and I will see you in the next one.